and thank you for joining me today. I'll be distilling the first chapter from the book How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Robertson. And the first chapter is called The Dead Emperor. And before we start, if you'd like to see more videos on Western philosophy, Buddhism, Zen, Taoism, and meditation, can you please do me a favor and hit pause and then click subscribe and leave a thumbs up and tell a friend if you like the content. But now that you've done that, let's get started. And so we start the chapter at the end of Marcus Aurelius's life. At 58 years old, he's about to die from the Antonine Plague. Marcus has been considering his death for some time. Uh, he's had to face death before, though. His father died when he was young. Eight of his 14 children died. His tutor died. And only a few years earlier, his wife Faustina died. Uh, his only surviving son would ultimately be one of the bad emperors. Commodus. And I probably didn't need to use the quotes. He was a bad emperor. Uh, he, Marcus was adopted by the Emperor Antonius Pius at the behest of the previous Emperor Hadrian, who might have seen something in Marcus, thinking this guy is going to be a great emperor. Uh, Marcus had some tutors for rhetoric and philosophy, including for Stoicism, which Marcus started focusing on in his 20s. Now, in his life, whether through plague or war, Marcus was beset by death. And now reaching it at the end of his life, he faced it. He stopped eating, for example. And he used his stoic practices that he learned, like imagining his dead imperial predecessors when he looked at his reflection. And he contemplated where they all end up, just all forgotten and turned to dust. He turned to his physicians to ask for descriptions of what exactly was arising in his failing body. He recognized that death is but a certainty of life, and there was no sense fretting about it. It's inevitable, so why fear it? Reflecting on his Stoic training, he used Stoic exercises daily to try to become the ideal Stoic, to have his mind seek reason and model himself after men he admired, like Antonius Pius, his predecessor, his emperor, who exhibited wisdom, justice, fortitude, and temperance. He knows that though he may feel pain and loss, he doesn't worry about it. Again, that's inevitable, and there's no sense in wailing to the world, why me? In fact, he had died a few times before, in a way. He died as a child when he became the imperial heir after Hadrian died. He died as an heir when Antonius Pius passed on and he became emperor, and now it was his final time to die. Marcus did appoint a successor, his remaining living son, Commodus. But the problem was Commodus was just 16 and the young are easily corrupted. Commodus didn't have any interest in philosophy. Marcus wanted his friend Pompeianus to continue Commodus's moral education. Unfortunately, Commodus had a poor record as emperor. Commodus paid little heed to Pompeianus. He didn't finish the war his father fought, but just bought off the enemy, which Pompeianus viewed as just giving more reason for continued blackmail by Rome's enemies who could smell weakness. And once he did that, why did the troops feel any kind of support? They paid them off. They paid the enemy off. So what are they fighting for then? Instead, Commodus retreated to the luxury of Rome. Enemies eventually surrounded 
and arose against communists. And after multiple assassination attempts, he became increasingly violent and paranoid and fearful of death, unlike his father, who lived to 58 despite persistent sickness and living in wartime conditions. At 31, Commodus was murdered. Now let's turn to the history of Stoicism and some literary sources. When we look at the history of Stoicism, it started when the Phoenician merchant Zeno of Sidium's ship uh, was destroyed in a storm and his cargo was ruined and that rendered him destitute. He wandered around Athens until he came to a bookstall where he read anecdotes about Socrates uh, from Xenophon in Xenophon's memorabilia, which changed him, kind of like the transformation we saw in Robertson when he encountered Socrates. Uh, Socrates thought that people could live a life of virtue and wisdom through self-discipline. Zeno wanted to find someone who would be like Socrates to himself. So the bookseller literally pointed at the, the cynic philosopher Crates, or it could be Crates, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm getting the pronunciation right, of Thebes, who was walking by them at the time. Uh, now Zeno eventually became a follower of Crates, or Crates, who emphasized building virtue and character through difficult training and hardship. Robertson crystallized what Zeno may have learned while he was a student in the Cynic School. What the Cynics meant was that our character is the only thing that ultimately matters and that wisdom consists in learning to view everything else in life as utterly useless by comparison. But that was just the ember of Stoicism. Zeno wasn't satisfied intellectually with what the cynics had to offer, so he sought a synthesis of cynicism with some of the other schools, like Plato's Academy, which focused on metaphysics and what is reality, as well as the Megarian school, which focused on logic. There is a point made in Zeno's school that studying things is great, if they increase our character or virtue, but it's bad if it takes us away from those things, and then it could be called a vice. Marcus was warned to stay away from logic and metaphysics, for example, and that his focus should just be on living wisely. Zeno said he valued wisdom over wealth or reputation. But don't things besides virtue have value? And don't, in fact, we need them to have a good life? Well, no, according to the Stoics. It is beneficial to have these other things. Like, of course, it's you want to have good health over bad health and abundance to poverty. Zeno's school ultimately became known as the Stoic school, named after the porch or stoa where Zeno lectured. Zeno school had broadened from the Cynic school, though, and that it taught ethics, logic, and metaphysical theology. Zeno and his successors, Chrysippus and Cleanthes, built the initial teaching of Stoicism. And Chrysippus, in particular, sought to update and defend Stoicism, as Stoicism isn't a very academic, but a practical philosophy, and it evolved. Around 200 BC, the Roman general Scipio Africanus the Younger established a group in Rome called the Scipionic Circle, and he was the last leader of the Stoic school in Athens before it came over to Rome. So now we turn to the Roman Empire in our history, and we look to the Roman writers where much of our knowledge of Stoicism comes from. So there's Cicero, who was actually a follower of Plato's Academy rather than the Stoic school. He wrote extensively about Stoicism. You also have Seneca, who's a tutor and advisor to Nero. He wrote about Stoicism. Uh, fun fact, fun in quotes. Uh, Seneca would be executed by Nero 
for disagreeing with his politics. Hmm. However, Nero had a secretary who in turn had a slave called Epicitus or Epictetus. I'm, I've never been sure how to exactly pronounce it. We'll call it Epic, Epic, Epicitus sounds good, but Epictetus, whoever you want to correct me in the comments, who taught Stoic philosophy after he was freed by his secretary. Uh, we have Epictetus' handbook called the Enchiridon, which I think is a fantastic name, kind of mystical name, uh, and also Epictetus's discourses, courtesy of his students Arian's uh, lecture notes. Marcus was very partial to Epictetus. He really liked him. Uh, and then we have Marcus Aurelius's writings. And note that one teaching of Stoicism is that the wise person is likely to write to help others. So that might have inspired Marcus to write the meditations. And that could have happened after the death of his Stoic tutor, Junius Rusticus. Um, it is a mystery how the meditations have survived through the ages, but Marcus Aurelius's meditations remain one of the core texts of Stoicism. Now let's turn to Stoicism's aims. If if Stoicism is a practical philosophy, what do we get out of it? The goal in life for a Stoic, according to Robertson, is to live in agreement with nature. We need to drill down deeper to get what that really means in Stoicism to get to the difference. Uh, to live in agreement with nature is to live wise and virtuously. And since we are thinking beings, unlike other animals, we have the capability of reasoning. We can analyze our own thoughts. Now, we do this in Zen or Buddhism, but only partially. Uh, in Buddhism, we just notice the thoughts, and that's about as far as it goes, at least during meditation. Wisdom consists in reasoning properly about life. Turning to virtue, the four prime virtues we're concerned with are wisdom, justice, which is wisdom in a social setting, courage, which is wisdom with respect to fear, and moderation, which is wisdom with respect to passion. So from all that, you can see why Stoicism prized wisdom above everything. Uh, it's just the other virtues are just applications of wisdom and grasping the difference between things and reasoning well about them is what we're getting at with wisdom. We need to also consider how the Stoics value things. They could be good, bad, or indifferent. Now, since the Stoics value virtue above anything else, what about that stuff besides virtue? Right? So some things are preferred to others. And wisdom comes in where how we categorize them. It's not always so easy, though. Some things that seem offhand to be beneficial might really depend on the person using it. So let's say there's a kilogram of gold, right? It would have a different use in the hands of Adolf Hitler than by Mother Teresa. So the trick is, how do we use our wisdom rather than try to obtain a multitude of different things or get all sorts of different advantages in life? While we can pursue indifferent things, in doing so, we shouldn't violate our virtue. Pursuing something that would violate our virtues like wisdom, justice, moderation, or courage would be a vice. Now, a vice isn't just about seeking fame or drinking drugs or just giving into a craving. It's the failure to use reason or allowing something to corrupt our reason. That's the real sin. And stoicism isn't just about the individual. We are all social creatures. Stoics viewed cosmopolitan 
cosmopolitanism as an ideal and that we are all interconnected, starting with our own family and then branching out to the rest of the world. Uh, the virtues of justice, kindness, and fairness apply towards others, and we should recognize that others are reasoning people as well. With respect to emotions, the common notion that Stoics don't feel emotion is incorrect, stemming from the usual definition of Stoicism rather than how it actually is as a philosophy of life. Again, there are three different types of emotions, good, bad, and indifferent. There's a little bit more solid ground with the emotions here. Uh, they describe the good emotions like joy, which comes from living a life in accord with virtue and wisdom. Also, uh, aversion to vice, which would be having integrity, as well as desiring to help others and ourselves. But there's also emotions like anger, fear, and craving, and those are bad and should be replaced with healthier emotions. However, the immediate emotions that we feel, like automatic emotions when we're faced with a situation, those are indifferent. What matters is what happens next with when you deal with them. So here's a situation when you accidentally fall into the lion pit at the zoo. Are you going to use your reason? It would be courageous to recognize that fear and then to hide rather than to seek the glory of fighting the lion. Here's another situation. Uh, you see a bag of chips on the table and it's labeled special extra crunchy for maximum deliciousness. So you like, ah, oh, you stop to consider that. Do you just look at it and you say, screw it, and you're just going to eat that whole bag coming to your emotion of lust, or are you going to look at that big bag of chips, measure out a discrete amount where you're exercising moderation and temperance? So you're not really suppressing emotions in stoicism, and it's just not healthy. What you do is you transform them, and then you use reason to judge how to deal with them. You can become emotionally resilient, yes, but we can become just fair and kind towards others. And we look to the beliefs and values to see what is the basis for them and see how they hold up to reason. Well, CBT and rational emotive behavioral therapy also challenged those beliefs in a similar fashion to Stoicism. So Stoicism can help you overcome psychological problems like anger, loss, worry, and pain. And in the next chapter, we're going to continue our exploration of Marcus Aurelius's life, starting from his birth. We're also going to discuss the use of language as used in therapy and in Stoicism. And we'll see how the Stoic use of language differs from that of a rival school called the Sophists, who were the teachers of rhetoric. Thank you for listening to this distillation of the first chapter of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. If you'd like to hear more discussion and distillation of other books, please click the subscribe and like buttons and share this with a friend and look at some of my other playlists. If you have any comments, please feel free to add them and I'll increase the discussion about the book. I hope you get some value out of this distillation and hope to see you soon on Sloppy Zen. Have a good one.